Let's talk a little bit about cross guards. Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So you might notice there's a slight different angle here. I've got a new tripod, so we'll see how that works out. Um, and additionally, apologies that I haven't been doing very many videos in the last week, but I've been traveling for work, unfortunately. Although it had a bright side, a silver lining to the, to the cloud in that I got to meet some friends of mine in Glasgow where I was working, um, who run an excellent HEMA club up there called the Academy of Historical Arts and I very much recommend you visit them if you're in Glasgow in Scotland. Right, now on to cross guards. One thing that um, has been surmised, um, theorised and that I think is plausible and that many people I think don't know about, it's not widely known, I've only seen it in a few obscure sources, is that cross guards obviously have a protective function okay I'm not going to get into not in this video anyway I'm not going to get into why cross guards came about from Viking era swords which didn't have very long cross guards or you know even ancient era Roman era for example Sparthas and Gladius and so on and so forth which didn't have long cross guards for the most part although we do sometimes find longer cross guards in fact if we look at um, hoplite sort of period swords for example uh, if we look at Greek swords but in the medieval period, for the most part, cross guards came about in the, let's say, cross guards got longer in the 11th century. Obviously, cross guards had always existed uh, in a short form, but they got noticeably longer in the 11th century. And I've mentioned in previous videos one of my theories for that. Search back in my videos if you want to find out why. But that's not what I'm talking about here. And equally, I'm not really talking about what they do in terms of protection. Um, I've talked in the past about the fact that there's an angle and they, they cover, obviously it depends on the length of the cross guard and the length of the hilt, but they cover an angle in the alignment of the edge to the pommel and therefore provide almost a shadow um, for your hand to hide behind. Um, Additionally, other people have asked me about binding. I'm going to talk about that in a separate video um, and what function cross guards play in binding. But for the most part, I think we can say that the primary purpose of a cross guard on a medieval sword is to protect the hand better for really minimal effort, both minimal effort in terms of um, what's in the way. There's no basket hilt or you know saber type hilt in the way. Um, you can quickly get your hand onto the grip and all that kind of stuff. You don't have any obstructions. And in terms of manufacture as well, it's a simple thing to make. Um, it is a bar with a um, essentially a slot that's forged through the center that slides onto the tang. It's an easy thing to make for the most part. Obviously people out there who make swords and knives at this point will be going, no, it's really difficult. But yeah, relatively speaking, a simple medieval cross guard is one of the simplest types of guards that you can make for a sword. Clearly if you've got side rings or um, you know, like a, a basket guard or anything like that, it's more difficult, more labor intensive to make. And additionally, I should fleetingly mention mass or weight, uh, and that is you know, the fact that the more mass you add to the guard, the more mass you're adding to the weapon, the heavier you're making the weapon, and it will affect the um, sort of dynamics and the properties of how that blade performs. Generally speaking, if you want a sword to cut with the most effectiveness, usually a lighter hilt facilitates that and helps with that. So, the thing that I want to mention about cross guards, which isn't any of the things I've just spoken about, so it's not about hand protection and it's not about all these things and um, why it came about, it's that it potentially assists edge alignment. Now, I have heard a few people talk about this and some people will be going, oh, of course, everybody knows that. But I suspect that the majority of you will be going, edge alignment, how does it help edge alignment? Well, quite simply, um, <laughs> if you look at uh, a program like Forged in Fire, they refer to indexing a weapon. Now, this is, as far as I'm aware, this is a fairly modern uh, indexing your weapon. I think it probably comes from firearm stuff, I don't know. I don't know the origin of it, but to me, it's a relatively modern expression. But it makes sense, um, and when it comes to edged weapons, it could be a knife, it could be a sword, uh, it could be an axe. When it comes to indexing your weapon, what they're often talking about is edge alignment. And that is, when you pick up a weapon, if you've got your eyes shut, 
how do you know that your edge is pointing in the right direction? Now this is an incredibly important thing to know because with the sword it will only cut if the edge is aligned with the motion. Okay, yeah, you can do sort of curving cut stuff, but for the most part, a cut, a sword will only cut effectively and really effectively or most effectively when the edge is perfectly pointing in the same direction as the motion of the sword. If you twist the blade and hit, what will usually happen is at the moment of, I'm being somewhat careful because this is actually a sharp sword, at the moment of impact, it will flop flat. It will essentially fold flat. And this kind of duff cut, as I'll call it, or kind of like um, un misaligned or badly aligned cut, is actually incredibly well documented in 19th century accounts where soldiers who hadn't received very much training gave a duff cut and damaged or broke their sword in the process sometimes and very often, obviously, didn't cut. And what's interesting is, of course, there's a perception, and uh, amazingly this existed in the 19th century as well, that, oh, if I've got a sharp sword, well, of course it's gonna cut. I just hit someone with it. Surprisingly not. If you don't hit someone in the right way, you might not cut at all. You might not cut anything, especially through clothes. So if you hit someone in a, you know, a winter coat, or if they've got a big hat or helmet, you know, kind of like padded hat on, or bearskin or something like this, and you hit them without the edge aligned, the likelihood is that all you'll give them is a very slight bruise at the most. Um, you're not going to cut them. So if you don't hit with proper edge alignment with a sword, it's just like hitting someone with a walking stick, really. Um, it ceases to be a sword at that point for all intents and purposes. So how does the cross guard assist with edge alignment? Well, it comes into indexing and for me there are two main aspects to this. The first one is obvious and the second one is less obvious. The first one is very clearly if you have long extensions which are pointing in the direction of the front and back edge that means that in your hand whether you put the finger over it or whether you just feel your thumb against the side or whether you can just you don't do either of those things and you can just feel that cross guard sitting into that notice it naturally sits into that crook between your uh, index finger knuckle and your thumb knuckle the back cross guard sits in there and the front one sits in line with the uh, middle knuckle shall we say that knuckle of the index finger and you just know that once those two things are sat in there the edge is aligned so that's the first thing the first thing is you've got an indicator sitting right against your hand of which direction the front and back edges are so that's the first clue to indexing but there's another I believe and I've only, as I said I've only had heard a handful of people refer to this I believe there's another aspect to indexing or assisting with edge alignment when you've got a long cross guard and that is movement in this plane around the sort of axis as it were and when you do that you can kind of feel these extensions moving you know if you hold a stick again I'm not going to hold this sword because it's sharp but if you hold a stick and twizzle it like that you can feel the inertia of the two ends and it's exactly the same when you turn a sword that's got a reasonable length this is a particularly long cross guard it's why I picked this sword but when you pick a sword which has got a reasonably long cross guard you can actually feel even if you don't touch the guard when you just do that when you rotate the sword with your eyes shut around its long axis you can actually feel the inertia of those ends moving and I believe that again as well as feeling the cross guard that assists with the um, with indexing the edge and assists with edge alignment there is a final factor which I'm not sure about and I don't know the physics of. I know that I have people watching this channel who love to talk about the science of, of this stuff and that's great. Please feel free to contribute below. Um, also of course if you like this video please click like. If you're not subscribed already please subscribe. But the final thing um, that I would like feedback on and thought on is about um, about inertia I suppose I think it's inertia I think it would come under the under the rule of inertia and that is when something's moving in this plane um, very clearly if you imagine something that was very very wide and you're swinging it in a certain direction if you were to try and turn that very wide object 
it would kind of fight against you, okay? Because that, that very wide object is traveling in this direction. And if I now try to turn it, it will, it will kind of oppose me to an extent. And so the wider a blade is, and this is a phenomenon that I know, I mean, I did, uh, I have an A-level in physics, but that's a very long time ago. I certainly haven't studied physics at university, but I know lots of you have, um, and other related um, sciences. Um, I'm aware from holding in my hand swords which have very broad blades, or indeed which have curved blades, that when you swing them, they are more likely to stay aligned and keep good edge alignment than, for example, something like a rapier or a spadroon, which is more likely to turn. A narrow blade and a sword without a long crossguard is more likely to turn and deliver a bad cut, a duff cut, a, in fact, no cut. Whereas a sword which is broader or curved or which has long crossguard, somehow, for some reason, seems to maintain its edge alignment better. So, I'm gonna wrap it up there, um, but I very much welcome feedback below in the comments. And um, I think the main thing that I definitely want to say is that crossguards, whether they add to the, uh, um, the resistance to turning of, of the sword or not, I'm not 100% sure about that. But what crossguards absolutely do do, apart from just protecting the hand, which is of course very important, is they absolutely assist with indexing. And indexing is incredibly important. And swords which are hard to index, for example, spadroons, even some types of straight sabre, it has to be said, um, well, straight saber, that's a sort of oxymoron, but um, back swords, should we say, and certain types of almost straight saber can be really quite difficult to align in the cut. And one of the reasons for that is you don't have this type of guard to feel the edge alignment with. So absolutely, um, to wrap up, it, cross guards are fantastically useful at assisting edge alignment and you should never ever underestimate how important edge alignment is to any sword because a sword it's it only operating at 100% effectiveness when it's striking absolutely 90 degrees perpendicular to the thing that it's hitting any turn on the blade whatsoever and it will either perform very much worse like drastically worse or it will not cut at all so, cross guards, more to them than maybe you thought. Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.